boldly going where no science show has gone before. The Naked Scientists. Hello, welcome to this week's Naked Scientists with Ben Valsler. Hello, Ben. Hello, Chris. And also with me, I'm Chris Smith. Coming up, solving the salt problems. That's because Australian scientists have developed plants that can actually grow on salty soil and that could help some countries to avoid a future food crisis. So very important work. Also, how drugs that are designed to stop heart disease actually work better in some arteries than others. The twisty ones come off worse. But why? And also, the rap guide to evolution. We'll be meeting the man who's mutated Charles Darwin's principles of natural selection and turned them into a one-hour rap show. And that's all on the way. Ben. Thanks, Chris. Also this week, we're looking into the science of vision. We'll be exploring the deep ocean to find out how some fish become equipped with their own underwater searchlights that emit special light that only they can see. We'll also be hearing how the brain decodes what the eyes are seeing, as well as experimenting with our own colour vision to change the way that we can see colours. And uh, no LSD needed, or any other hallucinogen for that matter. It's actually a very cool experiment. If you want to have a go, all you need is some coloured plastic that you can have a look through. We'll show you how to do the experiment later. Meanwhile, if you'd like to get in touch with us, our email address for the programme, chris at thenakedscientist.com. The Naked Scientist podcast, powered by UK Fast, the UK's best hosting provider. On the web at ukfast.net. This week, scientists in Australia have made a major breakthrough in the field of crop sciences because they've managed to make plants that will tolerate saline contaminated soil. Let me explain why this is important. According to Mark Tester, who's from Adelaide University and one of the scientists behind this breakthrough, about one third of the world's crops are grown on soil that is irrigated and one fifth of that irrigated soil is now significantly contaminated with salt. Where did it come from? Well, there's a number of sources. One is that when you pump river water onto land, because the river water has come from water that has permeated through the ground and through rocks, it contains trace amounts of dissolved salts. When you put that water onto the ground, that water evaporates because of heat from the sun. It's also taken up into plants, and the plants then transpire the water into the atmosphere, and this leaves the salt behind. So over many, many generations of plant growing, what happens is that you get a progressive and significant accumulation of salt in the soil, which eventually becomes sufficient to poison plants. The reason it poisons plants is that the salt concentrates in the shoots and the new leaves of plants and it causes them to age prematurely, and so they just don't grow. They have to spend all of their energy making new leaves and tissues rather than making new growth or seeds and things we want to eat. So it's a big problem, and with the world population growing, in fact we'll hear more about that in just a second, it's going to become an even more acute problem, so we need a way to solve it. Also, with global warming and climate change on the way, we think that flooding and sea level rise could also put more agricultural land out of commission or contaminate the soil significantly. So what's the solution that Mark Test has come up with? Well, what he and his team discovered is that when you grow plants in a salty environment, they have a means of getting salt out of the plant. It's a gene which is called HKT11. One, And what this gene does is it transports sodium out of cells because one of the major salts that's poisonous is sodium. The thing is, if you turn this gene on too much in a plant, then it kills the plant. And similarly, if you stop the gene working, it kills the plant. So what they wanted to know is, well, can we make this gene just work in the bit of the plant that determines what gets sent up the plant to the shoots? And they've discovered how to turn this gene on just in a selection of tissues which surround vessels called the xylem vessels. And these are the pipes or conduits that carry water from the root up into the leaves. And when they do this, this means that the cells filter effectively the salt out of the water coming in the root and going up the xylem, and they repel the salt and turf it out. And what Mark Tester and his team have found is that they can grow Arabidopsis, which is just a a weed that basically plant scientists use because it's a convenient way to experiment. They can grow this on very saline soils. They don't actually know exactly how saline yet, but they have had some very promising results. We've given these plants concentrations of sodium which would normally kill them, and these salt-tolerant plants are still growing just fine, which is quite exciting. So we actually haven't worked out what how high we need to go to actually kill these plants off. The, the experiments are surprisingly difficult because this, this is a little plant which is quite hard to to grow in a controlled way. So they've obviously made a major breakthrough here if we can do this with Arabidopsis, but that's an experimental plant that we use a lot. We don't actually eat it. Can we do the same trick with something like rice or maize? 
According to Mark Tester, yes, I asked him about that and he says that they've managed to make the trick work in rice plants and rice is the staple food crop for a significant proportion of the human population, so that's a major breakthrough. Um, the big question about cereal crops, though, is they apparently are a little bit more genetically complicated than rice and uh, the thalcress, Arabidopsis is. So it's taken them a little bit longer to get that to work, but Mark says they now have experimental crops that they're testing, so in a year's time they'll know if it's actually working in them. But the principle seems sound. It's just a question of getting the right DNA construct to turn on the gene in the right class of cell so that the effect will work. But certainly all, all reasons to be encouraged. Excellent. Well, it's good to see that uh, genetic modification might help to feed the world one day, especially with a growing population. Now, this is quite horrifying, but every single minute a woman dies from pregnancy related causes somewhere in the world. Every single minute. And that statement came from the Population Institute in Washington and they made it to highlight World Population Day, which is actually being held by the United Nations Population Fund this week. Global population is growing at a phenomenal rate. It actually took all of human history up until 1830 for world population to reach 1 billion. The second billion was reached in merely 100 years, the third billion in 30 years, the fourth billion in 15, the fifth billion in 12 years. In fact, population is predicted to exceed 9 billion people by 2050. And we're made very aware of the threats of a changing climate. We've heard about how rising sea levels could force millions out of their homes. It could threaten food security and increase conflict. And rising population actually only makes all of these effects worse. Larger populations need more land for crops. This reduces forest cover, which decreases biodiversity and cuts out ecosystem services like pollination and pest control and so on. And all in all, growing populations make these things worse. Even things like poverty, HIV, AIDS, childhood illness, access access to drinking water and the effectiveness of vaccination programs are all made worse by overpopulation. So World Population Day is hoping to raise awareness of all of these issues, especially to governments who are considering ways to save money in the current financial climate. There's no quick fix, and they certainly acknowledge that, but an awareness of the problems and the opportunities can help us and our governments to make the right decisions. If we invest more in women's education, family planning, public health and other social services, this will make a difference and this shouldn't be allowed to suffer because of the current financial crisis. Already developing nations are feeling the consequences. For example, the credit crunch has affected HIV AIDS funding in Africa. 90% of family planning in Uganda relies on overseas funding and fully half of all the healthcare funding in Africa comes from sources in America. So what they're trying to say is that we really cannot let a financial crisis in the risk in the in the West become a humanitarian crisis in the developing world. It's also storing up trouble for the future, isn't it? They're, they're making the point this is going to be a false economy because if we don't carry on with the investment, uh, as you say, what will end up happening is there will be an even bigger population problem later, which which we will have to pay for directly or indirectly. So it's therefore a much smaller cost now, despite the the world economic situation, to invest and solve the problem now rather than let it fester when it will become a much bigger one. Exactly. Yes, certainly by 2050, 9 billion people, if we haven't fixed some of these problems or at least gone part of the way, then they're going to be so much bigger by then that really it's going to be a very, very difficult job to fix. Now, scientists have also published a paper this week in the journal Science. This is uh, Shigeru Kuratani, who I met, actually. He's been in Cambridge this week for the Darwin Festival, which was a celebration of Charles Darwin's contribution to the world of science. He's normally based at the Riken Centre, which is the Centre for Developmental Biology in Japan. And what he and his colleagues have done is to try and suss out how turtles got their shells. Not just turtles, but animals like them, things like tortoises too. It's an important question because at the moment it's very speculative. We think that what happened is that they evolved to use their rib cage in order to fuse the tissue between the ribs and form these hard bony plates, which are their shell. There's a big question though, which is if I ask you, Ben, where is your shoulder blade on each side? It's uh, outside my ribs, right on my back at the top. Where's a turtle's sh shoulder blade? Um... I guess it must be inside yeah. the if ribs. You look in the sh if you look in turtles, you look in tortoises. In fact, Japanese scientists don't discriminate between those two. They have one word, kami, which means both turtle and tortoise. Oh. Um, but the, the shoulder blades are on the inside. So how do they get like that? Because other animals which have a close relationship, genetically and evolutionarily speaking, to turtles, like birds, they have their shoulder blades in the right place, like us, on the back, outside the rib cage. So how does this happen? Well, they wanted to solve this problem. So they did a very elegant series of experiments where they took eggs and they compared the developing embryos inside eggs of chickens, 
because they're obviously birds. Mm-hmm. They compared a soft-shelled turtle. Right. And they also looked at mice, because mice are obviously mammalian lineage, and they're a useful comparator. What they find is that it's actually a very clever turtle-specific trick that goes on during development. So you have the body plan being mapped out, and normally what happens is you have your midline, where the spinal column will form, and the ribs grow outwards from that, away from the centre, and then they curve round towards the front of the body and come round to the front where they will either unite with the sternum or some cartilage, and they form a linkage at the front. The shoulder blade is actually outside the rib cage, and the ribs grow underneath it. What they find in these turtles is that the upper ribs where the shoulder blade is, in fact, grow out a bit, and then this very clever folding happens whereby the shoulder blade folds, or the whole, that bit of the embryo, folds in on itself, going inside, and then the ribs grow over the top. And they don't know which genes are responsible for making this happen, but what's really intriguing is that when they compared a fossil which was dug up in China, it's, uh, it's called Odontochelis, it was found in China, it's about 200 million years old, and this is believed to be one of the earliest common ancestors of turtles and other reptiles. This is a partially clad, it has a partial shell around the outside, and this, this ancient ancestor of turtles actually has its shoulder blades in a sort of intermediate position they're not quite all the way inside and they're not quite on the back either so this is viewed as a sort of uh, stepping stone evolutionarily speaking to what we see today so this very interesting discovery in eggs and developing embryos tells us how modern day turtles probably work based on this early evidence from the fossil record. That's really fascinating. I can see as well how that would fit into a Darwin festival, of course, if we're looking at how an animal, a really interesting and, and frankly quite confusing animal like a turtle or a tortoise has actually evolved. That's really, really cool. OK, also this week, the shape of blood vessels may affect how effective statins are at preventing heart disease. That's according to new research published in the Journal of Biological Chemistry this week. Now, statins, as many of you probably know, lower levels of low-density lipoprotein, or LDL cholesterol, that's found in the plasma of our blood. And by doing that, it helps to prevent the fatty build-ups that lead to blocked arteries and heart disease. Statins are very widely prescribed to people with a high risk of heart attack. And it's estimated, the NHS have estimated that statins have saved nearly 10,000 lives every year. Now, this research from a team at Imperial College London is the first to show that biomechanical forces actually affect how well statins will perform. One of the reasons statins are thought to help is by releasing antioxidants through boosting levels of an enzyme called heme oxygenase 1, or HO1, which is a bit easier to say, and that's created by the endothelial cells that line the inside of our arteries. So by measuring the levels of HO1 in different parts of the circulatory system, Dr Justin Mason and his colleagues were able to ascertain how useful statins are under different conditions. And they found that the increase in HO1 was significantly higher in cells that are exposed to fast, regular blood flow compared to areas where the blood flow was sluggish. So this means that where blood vessels branch or they twist around a lot, then the flow is disrupted there and statins show fewer beneficial effects. Now, unfortunately, arteries don't clog up in a uniform way and are actually more likely to develop these fatty deposits in the areas where the blood moves most sluggishly, exactly where the statins have actually work less well. So it's a bit of a double whammy, isn't it? it, That's exactly how Dr Mason described it, actually. Other research has shown before that the cells lining our arteries can sort of sense the sheer stress exerted by passing blood, in particular where it changes direction, and that alters their ability to keep the artery healthy. So they now intend to work with fluid engineers to discover how to get the best from statins because they show a lot of promise already. But really, we need to work out what's going on, why these twisty bits of arteries aren't as good, why the statins don't work as well there, and try and get the full beneficial effect of it, regardless of the rate and smoothness of blood flow. We already know that statins are safe and effective drugs, so this research could expose a way to save even more lives. Uh, They also say that they should be in the drinking water because everyone over the age of about 45 probably can benefit from them. I think that's the evidence at the moment. Crikey. Maybe I should go and get some. (laughs) Thanks for that, Ben. Now, this week was also Cambridge University's Darwin Festival. We alluded to it briefly earlier. 
what actually happened was that we've had a full week of events which have been designed to celebrate the 200th birthday of Charles Darwin, who was actually a Cambridge University student. Also, it's 150 years since he published arguably one of the most famous books of all time, The Origin of Species, which effectively rewrote our understanding of the world of biology around us. But one event that took place as part of the festival and really leapt out was when a Canadian hip-hop artist, he's actually an erstwhile medieval uh, historian, his name's Bubba Brinkman, unveiled his answer to Darwin, which is his rap guide to evolution. And he spoke to David Fisher all about it. The week here at Cambridge has seen mostly older, scholarly types in panel discussions or alone at the lectern, analysing, speculating, debating and theorising over every nuance of Charlie Darwin's existence. So for a summary of the week, here's rap artist Barbara Brinkman, who covers every angle of every session in his hip-hop show, The Rap Guide to Evolution. So what you know about natural selection? Go ahead and ask a question and see where the answer gets you. Try being passive-aggressive or try smashing heads in and see which tactic brings your plans to fruition. And if you have an explanation of mine, then you're wasting your time because the best watchmaker is blind. It takes a certain base kind of impatient mind to explain away nature with intelligent design. But the truth shall set you free from those useless, superstitious beliefs in a literal Adam and Eve and that Edenic myth because their family tree is showing some genetic drift. Take it from this bald-headed, non-celibate monk with the lyric equivalent of an elephant's trunk. It's time to elevate your mind state and celebrate your kinship with the primates, the weak and the strong. Who got it going on? We lived in the dark for so long. The weak and the strong. Darwin got it going on. Creationism is dead wrong. Tell him, Dawkins. This Canadian rapper is no scientist. His area is medieval literature. After applying rap to the Canterbury Tales, he was approached by a microbial genomist who asked if he could do for Darwin what he did for Chaucer. Barber read his way through a pile of books on evolutionary biology and outspawned his Darwin show covering every aspect of the great man's work. And according to Barber, there's a curious similarity between the creation, sorry, the growth, the evolution of an artistic work and any living thing. When I first started writing this show back in January, early drafts of the script sounded a little bit like this. Yo, yo. The origin of species. Ain't no feces, dog. <laughs> Believe me. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, then, and that was all I could think of. And then I thought... <laughs> I thought, well, <clears throat> maybe my show needs to get rewritten. And sometimes people ask me, how does your show get written? Like this, performance, feedback, revision. And how do I generally develop my lyricism? Kind of like this, performance, feedback, revision. And how do human beings ever learn to do anything? Like this, performance, feedback, revision. And evolution is kind of just an algorithm, isn't it? That goes like this, performance, feedback, revision. So really the genetic code of every living thing was written like this, performance, feedback, revision. See, the genes are like a text with a thousand pages, and revisions occur in the random changes that come from mutations. And then when they That's rap artist the light, Bubba Brinkman course, from Canada, who was over here in Cambridge, touring with his rap, effectively Darwin set to a rap tune. He was talking to David Fisher, who is an honorary member of the Naked Scientist for a week, but you'll normally find him at the ABC at Radio National in Sydney, Australia. And we've actually got a recording of that entire show and we're going to be publishing it for you as a special podcast on our website later this week. So if you check out thenakedscientist.com forward slash podcasts, then you should be able to listen to all of Bubba Brinkman's show. This is The Naked Scientist with Chris Smith and with Ben Valsler. We're talking about the science of vision this week. So if you have any questions for us or any general science questions, you can send them in. The email address, as always, chris at thenakedscientist.com. Keeping you abreast of the world's best science, The Naked Scientists. You are listening to The Naked Scientists with me, Ben Valsler, and with Dr Chris Smith. Don't forget you can also listen to us online from anywhere in the world or even out of the world in Second Life.
And uh, Octavius Zebendian is in Second Life, says, Never listened to the show live. Been listening to our podcast for four years. Congratulations, you survived listening to us for that long. <laughs> He's finally got up early and caught us on Second Life. So welcome to you. Uh, got some questions in, re- in relation to last week's show as well, Ben. Uh, you covered a program, in the program, you covered a story on silent cars. This was the fact that um, with new generations, new breeds of cars, which are now running largely on electricity, uh, they don't make enough noise, and it means they're a danger to other road users, especially people who might be sight or hearing impaired, who are walking along the road and, and don't catch them. Uh, we heard from April Russell, who says, how annoying to make quiet <laughs> cars louder. Should I was listening to that show on July the 7th, and my immediate reaction was how annoying it would be to have nearly silent cars we have to make louder. Couldn't having cars emit some kind of continuous signal that could be picked up by a device that could be held by a vision-impaired person and so the proximity of the vehicle could then change the, the behaviour of that thing, such as um, a bat, for, for instance, uses echolocation. Could the same sort of thing be used to alert a person who is beside the road and, and therefore they would know there was a car approaching? That's a, a very nice idea and I can see how it would work, but I can also see a couple of problems because... If we start to rely on these, if you have the the vision-impaired community relying on these in order to avoid being hit by very quiet electric cars, then what happens when it goes wrong one day? And I really think that we need to find ways where we don't rely entirely on technology to get around this. I've wondered what they must do in Holland, because I've been to Holland a few times, and they have trams there that are virtually silent as well. And with the amount of cyclists around, crossing the road in Amsterdam really can be quite a hazard, because there'll be cyclists coming from one way, a tram coming from the other, and if you're not looking out carefully they might well hit you so i think we'll probably find a way around it that doesn't involve this sort of technology but it's a really nice suggestion thanks very much we've also had a question which also relates to uh, last week's show in the news you said that there's a new potentially oral treatment for dogs and cats that get to fleas and ticks and it actually comes from a special fungus that we can use so one of the questions here we've had from matt in south africa he says one of the characteristics of the toxin mentioned was that it it affected all insects but had no effect on pets or humans so in this case wouldn't it be a great way to help to bring down mosquitoes and other human pest populations as well what do you think indeed this was the nodular sporium fungus which is an environmental fungus but it produces nodular sporic acid which the paper we reported on last week is scientists making a version of that called nodular sporamide which targets an iron channel which is only present in insects it's not present in people and it's therefore neurotoxic to insects but because we don't have that iron channel it's harmless to us i suppose it's possible that we could do the same thing for other flying insects the problem is of course you'd have to dose enormous numbers of people if you're going to dose enormous numbers of people with something you might as well give them an anti-malarial drug in the first place so i guess that that's one of the criticisms isn't it that if if you're going to do something like that well might as well treat the disease that's mostly the problem but it's a good idea and it it may be that that's one way to tackle this that's very true if we already had the facility to dose that many people with any medication then yes we'd be using anti-malarials wouldn't we nat spirit who's listening to us in second life says uh, one way of making silent cars noisy would be to make them rap which would make them noisy (laughs) not sure about that Uh, troy mcluhan very quickly asked could you make a phone call with a mobile phone in a car underwater at the bottom of a river? What he's getting at is that radio waves do not propagate very well through water. Part of the reason is a radio wave is an electromagnetic wave and as water contains lots of dissolved salts and ions, you can't get the signal to go very far. That's why submarines, when they have, uh, they're have they underwater, they can't communicate very easily. They have to surface or they can only they can only communicate with limited range and they tend to use sonar because sound travels very, very easily underwater but radio waves are, are soaked up by the, the fact that there are a moving electromagnetic wave and this makes the ions in the water go backwards and forwards and so you lose all your energy in your radio wave very quickly underwater. Oh, right, so I wonder... Should you happen to be trapped in a car underwater at the bottom of a river, how on earth do you get somebody to come and help you? I think you have to get out. I don't think your mobile phone (laughs) signal is going to spread very far, unfortunately. (laughs) Okay. well, coming up, we'll be finding out how the eye works and how it can be adapted to see even deep underwater where very little sunlight gets through, plus how the brain pays attention to what our eyes are seeing and how sometimes we can trick ourselves with an optical illusion. There are a few of those on the website right now if you'd like to have a look. Just go to thenakedscientists.com. There's a link at the top of the page. But first, I met Dave for this week's Kitchen Science, and I was very surprised to find him there with plastic sweet wrappers stuck on his face. Now, I hadn't caught him raiding the office tin of sweets. He's done that already. (laughs) I think I may have had one or two or too many of those. But this was, in fact, all in the name of science. Well, this week, I thought we'd have a go at a little trick you can play on your colour perception. And all you need for this is some coloured transparent plastic, so something like sweet wrappers or even a coloured plastic bottle. 
cut out a piece about the size of your eye and put it over the top. Now, this reminds me of when I had some pink sunglasses a long time ago. That did very funny things to my vision. That's probably related to this, yes, Ben. (laughs) Okay, well, let's have a go at... You've got some green plastic, but I'll take some orange and we'll see. And this is effectively just an orange sweet wrapper. And I'm going to put it up to one of my eyes and shut the other one. And yes, everything has gone very orange, just like you'd expect. That's right. Now, you can leave both eyes open, just cover one with the plastic, and we now need to keep them covered for a couple of minutes. So the eye covered in plastic gets used to being covered in plastic. Um, It's quite weird looking through a piece of plastic because your vision sort of is slightly confused because you have one eye telling you that everything's green in my case and your other eye saying it's normal, but we'll carry on like this. It's like wearing 3D glasses, those red and blue ones, whilst not looking at anything that is supposed to be 3D. This is where it actually works better if you're in a bright area, so best to do it during the day, ideally outside. Okay, now why is it that this plastic actually works? Why is it that it's only letting the orange light through? Well, your orange piece of plastic absorbs all the colours of the rainbow which don't make up orange. So it'll absorb um, a bit of red, lots and lots of greens and blues, especially blue. This means that the only light which ends up getting through it is reds, particularly oranges and a bit of yellow. And so the light which is coming through it looks orange. Everything you look at looks orange. And I guess the same is true for your green one. It absorbs everything that isn't green and only lets the green wavelengths of light through to your eye. That's right, yes. Now, should we take them off? When you take it off, the effect only lasts a few seconds. So what I want you to do is look at the world through one eye, then the other eye, then one eye, then the other eye, and see if you can notice anything strange. Okay, so I'm going to fix on a point in the distance, and I just need to alternate from one eye to the other. And I'm going to take my plastic off now. Oh, wow. Um, Everything looks normal through my left eye, but my right eye, everything looks kind of blue, as as if I'd taken it using a camera that's on the wrong settings. It's just about going now, but it still looks much bluer and actually much brighter than my left eye. Yeah, and with mine, it looks sort of bright, purpley, magenta sort of (laughs) colour. Well, that's incredible stuff. Now, I did notice something similar when I had my pink sunglasses on for a long time. Everything would go a little bit green afterwards. What's going on in our eye to make this happen? Well, this is all because your eyes make all sorts of clever compensations for the fact that the light you see things in can change quite a lot. For example, at sunset, the light's really red, or maybe um, after sunset, it can be quite blue. But you still want to see things which are green as green and red as red, because you're interested in whether that's a tiger over there, not exactly what shade it's looking like. (laughs) So going back to what I was saying about cameras, this is white balance, isn't it? Because you can set your digital camera so that it knows that white is white, And like you said, at sunset, whites can look a little bit orange. So if you set it for sunset setting, it will still make sure that everything appears the right colour. And is it our eyeballs doing that or are our brains doing that? It's actually happening in the back of your eyeball in your retina. Inside the light-sensitive cells in your retina, they make a chemical called visual purple or rhodopsin. And this actually does the sensing of the light. When light hits it, it changes structure, it absorbs some of the energy, which then goes through all sorts of complex chemistry, which ends up sending the electrical signal back to your brain. So it's the rhodopsin that actually converts light into this electrical signal that my brain needs. But how is that affected by colour? The first thing is that the rhodopsin gets used up when it gets hit by light, and your cells can only make it at a certain rate. So the brighter the light is, the less rhodopsin is in the back of your eye, which actually makes your retina less sensitive. So that's why if I've been out in the bright sunlight and I come into a dark room, I actually can't see anything for a little while. But surely that's just to do with light and bright, and that's got nothing to do with bits of orange plastic making the world look blue. Oh, well, in the back of your eye, you've got three different colour sensors, red, green and blue, they're called cone cells. So if the world looks very, very green, then the rhodopsin in the green ones will get depleted, but the other ones won't be getting hit by any red or blue light, so they don't get depleted. So there's lots of rhodopsin in the reds and the blues and not very much in the greens. So when you take away the green filter, the reds and the blues are really sensitive and go, whoa, there's lots of red light, whoa, there's lots of blue light, so the world looks purple. But the green ones... They're not very sensitive because they've seen lots of light already, so they don't see much green, so the world looks purple. And with mine, it was absorbing all of the blue light, so when I then took it away, the blue sensing cone cells go crazy and everything looks really blue. That's exactly right, yeah. So because we understand what's going on here in the different colours of light, if I take it back to my digital camera, if I know that everything's going to be a bit orange, 
I can turn up the blue to make up for it. And that's why things still look the right colour. That's right. If you use an old digital camera in a room lit by incandescent old-fashioned light bulbs, all the pictures you take actually look really, really yellow because the camera isn't as clever as our eyes at taking into account these different colours of light which are illuminating everything. Fantastic. So this is why what we see isn't always what we think we're seeing. And sometimes you can fool your eyes with a bit of coloured plastic. We'll be back with more Kitchen Science next week. So even something as simple as a coloured sweet wrapper can change your perception of the world. And even if you wear rose-tinted glasses, your eyes will definitely adjust. Dave has put some footage of this. Obviously, he couldn't take footage of what his eyes were seeing, so he's had to digitally fake it. But in fact, it's exactly the same thing that you would see if you were to try this out. So have a look at thenakedscientist.com slash kitchen science, and you'll find Dave's own eye view. Did you really have some pink sunglasses? I did. As a matter of fact, I wore them all day, uh, one day at school, and many of my teachers asked me to take them off, and I told them that this was the experiment I was doing, that I genuinely wanted to know. I knew if I wore them for a few minutes, then my vision would go green for 30 seconds or so, but I thought, what if I wear it all day? How long is it going to be green for? And sadly, it was still only 30 seconds or so. So you didn't have all, all these people looking like the Incredible Hulk? No, no, sadly. Well, if you've had a go at the experiment and you are seeing some funny colours now, then do let us know, please. The email address for the programme, as always, chris at thenakedscientist.com. If you have any questions related to the visual system, this week we're also talking about the science of how we see. So keep your calls and thoughts, comments and ponderings coming in. Lifting the lab coat on the world's best science. The Naked Scientists. It's The Naked Scientist with Chris Smith and with Ben Valsler. We're talking about the science of eyes and the visual system this week. And in a second, we'll be finding out what actually is an optical illusion. How does it work? And do bees fall for the same trick? That's on the way. But first, we welcome Professor Ron Douglas. He's from City University in London. Hello, Ron. Hello. Now, you've made an amazing discovery about uh, one way in which some fish see things, which we'll come to in just a second. But first of all, tell us, first of all, very, very simply, how do eyes work? OK, well, as we've heard already, it's important to understand that vision involves both the eye and the brain. And really, in some ways, the eye is like a camera in that it produces an optical image of the world and it then converts that optical image into something that the brain can understand, which is a series of electrical signals. So the cornea and the lens at the front of the eye make the image, and then the retina, as we've just heard, converts that image into electrical signals, which the brain then interprets. Now, one of the things you're very interested in is animals that live beneath the sea. The sea's blue for a reason, because it soaks up all the red light. That's why blood doesn't look red underwater. So the people who made Jaws were kind of misleading us a little bit, weren't they? Because blood looks a sort of black colour, because there's no red light to illuminate it. So what do animals that are deep underwater, where the spectrum of light is very different, what do they do to accommodate or adapt to that? Well, because of that... and. In the, in the deep sea, there's really two sources of light. There's light from the sun, but that's all gone by about 1,000 metres. And the ocean is up to 10,000 metres deep, and most of the eye, uh, animals that live there have large and fully functional eyes, so they clearly must be looking at something. And they're looking at light produced by other animals. That is, they're um, looking at bioluminescence. Now, this bioluminescence, like the sunlight, tends to be blue because blue light is just transmitted best by seawater. So deep sea animals generally have eyes which only see blue and they're not at all sensitive to red because, as you said, all the red light is gone. And things like a giant squid have enormous plate-sized eyes, presumably because the bigger you make your eyes, like the telescopes we, we use, the bigger the, the telescope, the more light it can gather, therefore the more you can see. Absolutely. You want a, a big aperture, so you want a big pupil, so that means you need a big eye. So you just have a big eye to catch as much light as you can. So if you look at the uh, retina in these undersea creatures, are they largely then, because most of these animals that, that they're looking at are emitting light that's are lights that are bluish, are they mainly picking up blue light? They haven't got the ability to detect light at the other end of the visual spectrum, like reds and things? Well, I would say 99.9% .9 no, they can't see reds. Um, but we have found one group of fish, the so-called dragonfish, which produce red light. So they're producing red light that really nobody can see, except they themselves. We've shown that they are very sensitive to red light. So they basically have a, a secret wavelength. They have a red searchlight stuck on the top of their head, and they can use that, for instance, to illuminate potential prey. 
and the prey just don't know they're being looked at. It's kind of like a sniper scope on the end of a rifle. Well, it's like an infrared camera, I suppose, isn't it? We can't see infrared, but the person operating the infrared camera can see us because they're, they're looking in a, a wavelength regime that we're not sensitive to. Yes, it, it's exactly like that. And, of course, they can also use it to um, talk to each other because down there all the animals have very big teeth, basically because the density of animals is quite low, so you rarely meet your lunch. So when you do, you want to make very sure that you can eat it. So it's a rough, tough place down in the deep sea. But if you have a light that you can flash on and flash off and talk to your friends, you know, for sex or whatever you have on your mind, then nobody else can see that you're there. Do they use that to communicate so they can hunt together? Or is this purely just to attract a mate or to ward people off, this is my territory, stay away? I, we don't know because it's very difficult to make observations on live animals that deep. My guess is it's mainly for communication. There's no evidence that they're territorial and there's certainly no evidence that they hunt as a pack. What about these fish that you've recently described, just this one species, that don't have traditional eyes? They actually use mirrors, a bit like some of the funky telescopes that we're making to look at the, the heavens these days use mirrors rather than lenses. How do these fish do that? Well, they've got very interesting eyes because the eyes are made up of two parts. Now, the two sources of light in the ocean, as we've said, are, are the sunlight, which, of course, comes from above. So a lot of deep-sea animals have tubular eyes which point up towards the sky to make the most of the residual sunlight. But, of course, the bioluminescence which the animals make happens all around you. So if you've got these tubular eyes looking upwards, then you're not going to see all the bioluminescence that's happening to the side and is happening underneath. So we found these fish that have an eye that made of two parts. It has a tubular eye looking upwards, but it also has a second eye, or part of the same eye, which actually looks downwards. And the interesting thing was, while the tubular eye that looks upwards focuses light using a lens, just like anybody else, um, the eye that looks downwards doesn't have a lens in it. Instead, it has a mirror, and it focuses light using a mirror. When you say mirror, what tissue is doing that? How have they evolved to be able to reflect light rather than just absorb it or focus it? I think most of us have seen when we look at nocturnal animals, something like a cat or maybe a deer, when you catch it in the headlights of your car, their eyes suddenly light up. And that's because animals that live in low light levels have a reflective layer behind their light-sensitive cells called a tapetum, so that the light that goes through the retina and isn't absorbed by it gets bounced back, so the retina has a second chance of absorbing it. So most animals, including deep sea fish, have these reflective tapeta, and this mirror is really just a modification of this reflective tapetum. Is it evolutionarily the same origin then as the dog and the cat and the deer and the cow and the horse, or is it evolved independently? No, it's absolutely the same. It's made of the same chemicals. It's made up of plates of a crystal called guanine. It's identical in every way. Fantastic. Thank you, Ron. That's Ron Douglas. Uh, he's from City University, and he'll be with us for the rest of the programme. So if you have any questions for him about how the visual system works, specifically re with relation to what you've heard, do get in touch. It's chris at thenakedscientist.com. Now, that's how the eye itself works, even in some very unusual circumstances. But an eye alone isn't much use without a brain to interpret what the pictures mean. It's not fully understood just yet how the brain interprets information from the eyes. There have been some very great advances recently. A Japanese team could predict what letter was being read just by looking at brain activity alone, for example. But we do still have a long way to go. Now, one problem is the issue of attention. How does the brain know what's important in any given view? Professor Professor Alex Teeler is from Newcastle University, where he's trying to work this out. I'm interested in how attention works, and particularly in a mechanistic analysis of attention. So we kind of know what attention does to various aspects of our everyday perception, but we don't really understand how it is implemented in the brain. So I'm looking at the brain chemicals that mediate various aspects of attention, and I'm also looking at uh, how neurons are affected by these brain chemicals and how neurons communicate and how neurons interact during attention. And one current view is that synchronous or oscillatory activity between groups of neurons is a very important uh, aspect of attentional processing. And I'm looking at those aspects, how different areas synchronize their activity and what these neuromodulators or neurotransmitters, these brain chemicals, what role they play in this, this synchronicity. 
Attention is a word that we use in common language a lot. We we pay attention to a television program we're interested in or we pay attention to the weather broadcast, for example, to know what's coming up. Does it mean the same thing for you as it would do in common parlance? In a way, it does, and at the same time, it doesn't. Um, I think uh, until a few years ago, attention was used in a fairly restrictive manner. But most people now start to argue that attention really is just a process that allows us to use task uh, relevant information appropriately. So if we are involved in a certain task, then we have to pay attention to the aspects that allow us to do the task. In tennis, it's one specific set of aspects, looking at the ball, making sure our movements are right. If we watch the weather forecast, it's a different task. So attention really allows task-relevant information to be processed adequately and uh, non-task-relevant information to be excluded from interference. So how do we know what's going on in the brain while we're diverting our attention to one particular thing? Um, We know that uh, neurons that process this uh, particular aspect increase their activity, so to speak, they shout louder. We also know that certainly in certain areas, neurons are synchronous and synchronous activity is kind of like clapping, a clapping audience that is synchronous where everyone claps at the same time makes the whole theater be much more noisy, much louder. And that's what synchronicity in the brain also does in a way. So we know neurons shout louder. We know they uh, act all together that then makes sure that basically they uh, are above the noise and that aspects of the visual world reach consciousness. The brain is a phenomenally complicated and wonderful thing, but it does have a tendency to go wrong. Are there processes where this attention can break down? We are all distractible. There are diseases where attention doesn't work properly anymore. I mean, Alzheimer's disease is one example. Late stages of Parkinson, certain stroke types show that attention doesn't work properly. In everyday life, um, it would be more distractibility that we can't focus properly. But how this actually happens in everyday life, I don't think people understand properly yet. And one of the things you're looking at is, is brain chemistry. How do the different chemicals in the brain translate to paying attention? Well, we know very little about that. Uh, We know that certain chemicals which are called modulators uh, like acetylcholine or dopamine or adrenaline play some role in attention, but exactly what role they play is still very little research. I mean, we recently were able to demonstrate for one particular part of the brain, the primary visual cortex, that acetylcholine mediates its effect through a specific receptor type, but that is just in this one particular area. All the other areas are still, it's, it's unknown how acetylcholine works there. It is also at least to a large extent unknown how, for example, dopamine contributes to attention in a very, very detailed and mechanistic manner. And then there are the more traditional neurotransmitters like uh, glutamate, which acts through certain receptors again where a specific receptor type may or may not contribute to attention. So we're just about to begin to understand how these different brain chemicals contribute to various aspects of attention and also to what aspects of attention because as I said at the outset, attention is a complex phenomenon. It it allows task-relevant information to be processed and different neurotransmitters may allow different types of task relevant information to be processed accurately so it's and well in a way fortunately but at the same time unfortunately a rather complicated interplay of all these brain chemicals so there's so much still to learn this is really exciting stuff he was a wonderful chap to talk to and really it is an interesting question of what does attention mean to me and what does it mean to him and what does it mean to other people so there we go that is professor alex teeler from newcastle university explaining how the brain relies on coordinated nerve activity and a whole cocktail of chemicals in order to pay best attention to the world depending on exactly what you're doing at the time Thank you, Ben. Uh, We heard from Octavius, who says, why do night vision goggles traditionally produce a green image? Well, I think this is probably a legacy of our pre-LCD era. We we take for granted having these flat screen, very light screens now. But in the old days, not so long ago, actually, we relied on cathode ray tubes. 
these big old giant television like things that we we all had in our living rooms and that technology could be condensed down to something fairly compact but still quite bulky which was the way of making an image on a screen Green is a good choice for two reasons. One is that the phosphors, the things that glow and make the colour, are relatively easy to make for green. And because the eye is more sensitive to green light than virtually any other wavelength, it means that you can make your display dimmer than any other wavelength and your eye will be sensitive to it. And it means, therefore, you can run your thing with less power than you would otherwise need to make another colour visible. So green's a good choice. And uh, I think also, when you're looking with night vision goggles, you're actually seeing monochrome anyway. It's a black and white picture anyway. There's no colour information that can be conveyed so it doesn't matter that it's only just in one color and the dragonfish that live in the deep sea that i was mentioning just now that see red light they actually see the red light using chlorophyll and the laboratory in the states have now started putting chlorophyll into the eyes of mammals things like rats and mice and have been able to make them super sensitive to red and there's even been the suggestion that you could do this with humans so that you could make them almost infrared sensitive and you wouldn't need goggles at all so this would be a sort of military application. You could give your pilots or, or your armed personnel super red vision so they, they, could, they could see the enemy on the battlefield glowing because they were putting out heat. Absolutely. Theoretically, shall we say. <laughs> that sounds awful. Thank you, Ron. Laying the facts bare. I say. The Naked Scientists. You're listening to The Naked Scientists with me, Ben Valsler, and with Dr Chris Smith. The only visual information we have about the outside world, thinking about it objectively, is patterns of light that fall on our eyes. We just heard how the brain can interpret that light differently depending on what you're doing at the time. But actually all this means that we don't really see what's really there. The context itself is important. To find out why, Bo Lotto from the University College London is looking at optical illusions and finding out how bees see the world. Mira Senthalengam went along to have her eyes fooled. So what we're looking at is a, it's a very well-known, uh, very simple illusion called simultaneous brightness contrast. And so we see two small squares, and each of those squares is on two different surrounds. Yeah, looking at this, there are two grey squares. One's on a darker grey background and one's on a white background. And to me now, these two smaller grey squares look like different shades of grey. That's right. But if you were to put up a photometer, if you were to put up a light measure to them, you would find out that those smaller squares are physically the same. They're emitting the same amount of light to your eye, and yet they look differently bright. Now, most textbooks would say the reason for this is simply that one is on a light surround and one is on a dark surround. But that answer can't be right, because I can also create an illusion where something on a dark surround looks darker than something on a light surround. The illusion goes exactly the opposite direction. So it can't simply be that it's the lightness and the darkness of the surround that matters. The argument here is what those relationships meant for your behavior in the past. So having used all these images and knowing what you know so far, do you know much about the actual physiology and the mechanisms going on in our brains that cause us to see these illusions in this way? Well, to understand how we see illusions is to understand how we see generally. And what this work suggests is that the only way we can understand perception is to quantify our history of experience. Well, with humans, this is very difficult because our history is, for the most part, lost to us. But fortunately, to understand something like seeing color and dealing with the ambiguity of light stimuli, we don't need to focus on humans. In fact, we don't even need to focus on mammals. We can look at insects. And in particular, we can look at bumblebees. So the beautiful thing about bumblebees is that they see color and we see color. Their brain is able to resolve the ambiguity of light stimuli. And the wonderful thing about bumblebees as opposed to honeybees is that we can completely control their visual experience, which means that we can raise them in an environment where we know everything about the colors that they've seen. And we can look to see how that experience shapes itself in the architecture of their brain and also the resulting behaviors. So how do you now go about testing these bees because i just now have an image of you showing lots of illusions to bees well in a way we do actually so we do that in a space we call the bee matrix it's a plexiglass cube that's one meter on all sides and at one end you have 64 flowers that are lit up from behind and with these flowers we can we can control the color of by putting filters behind them And we can train the bees to go to certain colors and not others. So if they land on the right color, they get a sugar reward. If they land on the wrong color, they get salt water. So what we can do is we can train them to go to, for instance, find the blue flower. Except the blue flower is now under different colors of light. 
So the light coming from the blue flower varies. So what they have to do is they have to use the relationships between the flowers and the surround in order to figure out which is the correct one. And what we found is that they do that. They actually encode the color relationship so they can learn to go to the bluest flower in the array or the yellowest flower in the array. Now, sometimes a gray flower is the bluest flower if everything else is yellow. So it's actually a pretty complex thing that they're doing. And then what we can do is we can look to see how those relationships are encoded in the architecture of their brain. So the brain doesn't do absolutes. It can't do absolutes. There's no point in seeing absolutes. What it does is it encodes relationships. And it's actively encoding the relationships that matter. And this is all not just through the training of them from their birth, but it actually just goes back through the past evolution of the bees and of, for us, of us humans. That's true. So we come into the world with the ability to encode relationships. When we talk about experience, we don't distinguish between evolutionary history or development or memory. Basically, they're all different ways of doing the same thing, which is to shape the brain according to its trial and history of experience. So you now know this about the bee's behaviour, but what are you working on now and next in order to understand just what's going on inside the brain? So what we want to do now is try and discover how those relationships are actually encoded in the structure of their brain. And to do that, we can take little electrodes, which are fine, fine wires, and stick them into the brain of the bee, and we can listen to their brain cells while they see the history of their own visual experience. The reason why we do it in humans and bumblebees is that these are very, very different types of brains taking the same kind of information, coming up with the same solution. And if we can understand how both types of brains do it, then we can understand a principle that is relevant to both. I never would have thought that we could use bees to find out how the human visual system works. That's really The human brain even, although I do know some people that probably would benefit from an implant of a bee's brain. <laughs> One or two people, yes. That was UCL's Bo Lotto explaining to Mira Senthalingam how bees can help us understand the way that we see the world. Bringing the facts to bear. The Naked Scientists. We're talking about the visual system on The Naked Scientist this week. It's Chris Smith and Ben Valsler, our guest Ron Douglas. Ron, we've had a, an email from Jennifer Adcock, and, and she's basically saying, is what I call green the same for the next person? In other words, is what I'm calling green grass really the same visual experience for me as it is for, say, you? This is almost a philosophical question. The first thing to say is that what's happening in the eye in all of us is the same. We have the same chemicals, we have the same responses to the light. But it's what our brain makes of this information that's different. So, for instance, if you take, you know, you or I, you'll probably be appalled to hear we're fairly similar. Um, if you have all chips of all different colours and you put them into different piles, we would make a pile for green, a pile for blue, a pile for yellow, a pile for red. But if you ask people, for instance, some African tribes who've had very little contact with the Western world, they will put them into different piles. So they will put yellows and reds together and swear blind that they're the same colour and they will put blues in two different piles. And closer to home, um, even in Welsh, there is a word called glass, which encompasses what you and I would call blue, but it also co encompasses some things that we call green. Wow, but if you look in their retina, the thing that's doing the seeing and converting light waves into brain waves, is there a dramatic difference between the way the African tribes who do what you've just described are doing that and us? No, there's absolutely no difference at all in what the eye's doing, but it's a difference in the brain. Um, it's where culture comes into play and interacts with the visual stimulus. That's fascinating stuff. I wonder if it's genetic as well, if you have different social groups. There could be genetic differences in the eye making that difference. And last week we were talking about something that is genetic, and that's the photic sneeze response. Chris, James in Cambridge, says that he thinks it's because the light causes our eyes to water, the water drains into our noses near the tear ducts, and that irritates the nose. Is that what happens? No. Um, people did think that, but it happens too quickly. The photic sneeze reflex, to recap, is when you go out on a sunny day bright light comes to you and you suddenly feel this irresistible urge to sneeze, often multiple times. About one person in five is affected, tends to run in families, and it seems to be a neurological phenomenon. It's not a tear tickling your nose phenomenon because you tend to sneeze quicker than your eyes water. So people have sort of written off that theory, unfortunately. So we think it's more the same thing that makes your pupil get smaller and you blink in response to, hot, to, to bright light. Probably the same bit of the brain that's doing that is also crossing over into the um, sneezing centre a little bit and triggering both reflexes. So it's wiring rather than plumbing? Absolutely. 
<laughs> well, now it's also time for our question of the week. So we've, of course, invited Diana O'Carroll to join us again. Hello, Diana. Hello there. Well, for this week's question, it's our mission, and we're going to stick to it, to avoid any egg-based puns. My name is Michael, and I'm calling from Austria. Eating a wonderful Thai chicken for dinner, I got curious about the development of chicken embryos within their eggs. How does the oxygen come in within an eggshell without any placental gas exchange? So, how do chicks breathe before they hatch? My name is Kirsty Peck, and I work as a wildlife advisor for the RSPB. Well, an egg is a very complicated structure. And as you can imagine, it's got all the different life support systems for the chick in a tiny little package. The embryo itself lies right next to that huge yolk in the center of the egg. And as it develops, there are all kinds of membranes that will eventually form the different organs in the chick. One of these membranes, they call it the chorion, is one that it kind of envelopes part of the yolk sac and also it runs along the outside of the shell in part of the egg. The chorion has got a very thin walled network of blood vessels all along it and in the same way a blood vessel that you will find in a lung would be picking up oxygen from the air inside the lung. The chorion will pick up oxygen through the shell because you've got to remember the shell of an egg is porous so oxygen can come in and at the same time any carbon dioxide from the blood can be excreted out through the shell. The chorion acts as a lung tissue within the egg but what happens when the chick wants to escape? What happens at hatching is that as you probably know an oval shaped egg in the wide end of it there's a little air pocket and at hatching, as the blood vessels in these membranes will wither away and drop off, then the chick will be relying on the air in that air pocket as it's starting to break through the shell, which will give it kind of something like a scuba diver's aqualung or something to give it a limited air supply whilst it's uh, breaking out of the egg. So it's the pocket of air inside the shell which helps the chick whilst it's pecking its way out. And on our forum, we had some fantastic answers about porous shells, moving the egg to speed up gas exchange, and the egg version of a placenta. But by far my favourite answer came from forum regular Neil E.P., who has drawn a tremendously detailed diagram of the workings of egg ventilation. You can find it at thenakedscientist.com slash forum in our question of the week section. Now, be warned, it's very detailed, it's very nice, it feels I'm, I'm wrong. <laughs> I'm not sure how accurate it is. It's got an aircon unit. <laughs> and, <laughs> the humidifier. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, anyway, next week we'll be answering another breakfast-related question. Hi, oh, Naked Scientist. Could you please tell me what's happening when you hear the snap, crackle and pop with Rice Krispies? Thank you. So why snap, crackle, crackle and pop even? Write Photoshop or even sing your answers on our forum. And you can help us answer our question uh, by emailing us, and that's chris at thenakedscientist.com, or you can visit thenakedscientist.com forward slash forum. Thank you very much, Diana O'Carroll, for this week's Question of the Week. You can also get Question of the Week as its own podcast, nakedscientist.com slash QO. TW. Well, that's it for this week. Thank you very much to our guests, Ron Douglas and also Alex Teeler, and also to our production team, Diana O'Carroll, Mira Sintheringham, Dave Ansell and Steve Lines. We're back next week in which we're exploring the science of pregnancy and fertility, what actually happens when sperm meets egg. The Naked Scientist podcast comes to you from Cambridge University and is supported by the Wellcome Trust, the EPSRC and UK Fast. For more information, look us up online at nakedscientist.com.